He also serves as the Center of Military History War I subject matter expert and lead historian for all the War I Centennial Commemoration activities. It is a great honor for me to be here at a post named after uh, Hunter Liggett, who was probably the greatest uh, American combat commander of the war. Um, and I saw that he uh, covered a lot of General Liggett's life, and what I thought I wanted I could do today, particularly with the commemoration, is to give us some or give you some context of the war and kind of why Liggett's role and why the American and how the Americans uh, action and the American units fit in with the overall victory in 1918. Um, Obviously, the First World War is not a large topic of interest uh, within the United States. Uh, we were only involved in the war for roughly 18 months. Um, but we were a vital component for the victory in, on the Western Front. <coughs> and I think that, I hope that with this uh, centennial commemoration, we can kind of bring the story of the First World War to a lot of people because it's truly a remarkable event and it really symbolizes uh, the war era, it symbolizes the beginning of the modern army, the army that we know today and all of you serve in, or many of you serve in rather. So, okay. <coughs> so, the couple of just background information or, or some, some beginning information. The war is going to be fought between 1914 and 1918. It is going to be fought between two great alliances. One is going to be the Triple Alliance, known as the Central Powers of Germany, uh, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey. The other alliance is going to be known as the Triple Entente, uh, also known as the Allied Powers. Yes, I know, Triple Alliance, Central Powers, Triple Entente, Allied Powers gets a little confusing. But the uh, Triple Entente, the Allies, are going to be uh, France, Great Britain, and Russia. And so those two great alliances are going to be battling it out for supremacy um, in Western Europe and in, in Europe and truly around the world. There's roughly nine different fronts uh, at any one time that are going to be going on. So millions and millions are going to serve, millions are going to die. It is truly a, the Great War. It is one of the most destructive wars in human history. And for the United States, we are going to remain neutral between 1914 and the beginning of 1917. Uh, the American President Woodrow Wilson is going to determine that it is in the American best interest to uh, stay out of the war. And we are going to, he is going to call for Americans to be neutral in thought as well as deed. But then, in early 1917, the Germans are going to begin to seek an, a way to try and achieve some kind of strategic advantage on the Western Front and bring the war to an end. And one of the ways they're going to do that is to try and isolate Great Britain through the use of submarine warfare, and under what's what we call unrestricted submarine warfare. Essentially just attacking all shipping uh, without warning. This is going to be seen as a violation of American neutrality rights. A uh, number of Americans are going to die uh, in, who are on ships that are going to be sunk by the Germans. At the same time, the Germans are going to engage in a diplomatic act of folly and fancy where they reach out to, they make a <clears throat> ill-advised overture to Mexico to potentially support the, uh, the Central Powers in case um, relations break, out, break down between the Americans and the Central Powers and the Americans join the war. This is what's known as the Zimmerman Telegram. This is going to be published. And when you combine all of these things, it is going to drive Woodrow Wilson to decide that the Germans are in fact a threat to international peace and uh, democracy. So the United States is going to decide to join the war in early April of 1917. So a little, 
Wilson decides to go to war. But there's a real question about what does that actually mean? What does, what are we going to be able to do? The United States Army at the time, the regular army numbers roughly 135,000. Uh, the National Guard has about 180,000 uh, divided between uh, those on state service and those on federal service. If you add the National Guard soldiers who are on federal service to the regular army, the army when we join the war is roughly 210 to 215,000. Now to put that into some context, the, on the first day at the Somme in 1916, the British Army uh, is going to suffer roughly 50,000 casualties. So that means that at a full-on rate, full-on offensive operations, the United States Army effectively has a staying power of about a week on the Western Front. So we're going to, so we're, we're, we're not really in a position to make a material um, contribution to the war yet. So what we have to do is we have to build an army. And how are we going to do that? Well, the way that the Wilson administration decides is to do that is through selective service. So we have the creation of the selective service system and the institution of the draft. The, now we are going to um, create an army. They're not necessarily going to ra raise the level, the size of the regular army or the National Guard. What they're instead going to do is to create a new organization known as the National Army. And this is, if you see the magazine that is, uh, uh, we have copies out in the lobby. Uh, please take one. Uh, they are the army. They are army history. They're the magazine that my organization uh, publishes, and it discusses the history of the National Army. So the National Army is going to be essentially a, initially a conscript army. And now how are we going to differentiate? Well, they institute a new numbering system. And units from the regular army are going to be, divisions are going to be numbered 1 through 25. Uh, over 25 are going to, from 25 to 50 are going to be National Guard. And then over 75 are going to be National Army. Why am I bringing this up? because the two units, as I understand, that are located here right now are the 80th Division and the 91st Division. So they have a direct lineage to, in fact, they were created as part of the National Army during the First World War. And they are, in fact, going to be involved in some of the actions that I talk about today. <coughs> so we have a very small force. Uh, the United States has a very small force, but we are going to send a small contingent uh, led by General John J. Pershing to France to create what is known as the American Expeditionary Forces, or the AEF. Uh, that he, will, his, he and his staff depart very quickly for France. They arrive in early June. Uh, the 1st Expeditionary Division, which will be rechristened the 1st Division, is going to arrive soon after. And so we are going to start slowly sending forces. But it's going to take a lot of time. It takes a tremendous amount of time to build an army. The, you have to, with Selective Service, you have the registration, you have call-up, you have to actually build all of the cantonments and the camps, and then you have to institute training. We're going to build roughly 26 different camps and cantonments uh, across the United States, and this all takes a lot of time. And the training is going to be a multi-phase training system. We're going to have roughly three to four months of training within the United States. This is uh, what we would think of as basic training. And then more detailed training once they get to France. So it's going to take time. Now in the meantime, in 1917, the, the Allies undergo a series of disasters. The first is going to be in April of 1917 when the French army launches an offensive on the Western Front that is a disaster and it results in numerous elements within the French army who are going to mutiny. Uh, they are tired of the need, what they see as needless slaughter so they will agree to uh, defend France but they are not going to go on the offensive with these continual ceaseless uh, attacks without any hope for victory. 
So the leader of the commander of the French army, a man by the name of General Henri Philippe Pétain, is going to uh, quell the mutinies with the promise to wait for uh, the Americans and the tanks. And the tanks being actually this one. This is a Renault FT. The the British are going to suffer a um, failed offensive at Passchendaele, which is going to be in Belgium, uh, around the town of Ypres. And so that is so that is another uh, uh, failure on the Western Front for the Allies. The Italian army is going to be shattered at the Battle of Caporetto in uh, the fall of 1917. And then, at the same time, the Russians are going to fall into revolution uh, with the rise of the communists and the Bolshevik revolution, uh, and Russia is going to exit the war. So really, it's not a very good year for the Allies. Yes, the Americans are there, or have joined the war, but by the end of the year, we have roughly 200 to 250,000 soldiers in France. That's it. And so the Germans are going to be find themselves in a position of strength. They're gonna be able to begin to shift their forces from the Eastern Front that has collapsed with the collapse of Russia and start to begin building up forces in the West for what they see as will be an all out assault, presumably before the United States can begin landing forces uh, in sufficient numbers so as to make a significant impact. So what happens? Well, in beginning in March, on March 21st of 1918, the Germans are going to launch the first of what's known, or first of several offensives, which is collectively known as the German Spring Offensives. The first attack, uh, codenamed Michael, is actually going to, I actually have a uh, little pointer. That's Michael right there. And it is going to be a spectacular success. Uh, the Germans are going to be utilizing a new technique, a new uh, uh, combat technique known as infiltration tactics, uh, where they are going to have specially highly trained infantry units that bypass strong points, get into the enemy rear, and then follow on units, take, uh, take those strong points. And they, it's a really tremendously successful attack. As you can see, the where the line starts here, that's where the line was, and they're gonna take all of this territory. Now why do they attack here? Because this is the split point between the French army, which is down here, and the British army. And they're trying to drive a wedge between the French and the British. They are eventually going to be halted, but not before making a, driving a huge salient into the line, or a bulge. Now there are, uh, and this is the most the, the front has moved since 1914. So to put that into perspective, all the attacks that you hear in the Somme and, and at Verdun and so on and so forth, rain. the Allies are going to get some, they know that the Germans are thinking about doing something like this and they are going to be preparing. Now, <clears throat> For all of you planners out there, if all of, if your enemy has all of their forces here and here, where aren't they? They're not there. So what the what the Allies are going to determine is that if they can stop this this coming attack, then they can immediately go on the counterattack. And what we're going to have in July of 1918 is what's known as the Second Battle of the Marne. Between 15 and 17 July. The Germans are going to launch their offensive, again, here and here. We're going to have the 42nd, American 42nd Division is going to be engaged down here. The American 28th and 3rd Division and 26th Division are going to be in here. And this is actually where the 3rd Division earns the, the nomaker Rock of the Marne. So the Allies are going to be able to blunt this offensive and then immediately go on, on the attack with the launching of what's known as the Anne Marne Offensive on 18 July, spearheaded by the American 2nd Division and the first American 1st Division up here at the Battle of Soissons. 
And this is going to start where, what's roughly a three-week battle where the Allies are effectively going to be able to slice, and it's, an, it's a Franco-American attack, the French are all attacking and everything that's not shaded. And they're just able to effectively slice off this salient. Now what, <coughs> and this is the, the, the attack at, of, or the Battle of the Second Marne, for many, of, many historians is really seen as the turning point. Uh, this is the moment where the Allies are going to seize the initiative, uh, the Germans are no longer going to have the cap uh, capability to go on the attack, and the Allies are going to follow on with a series of offensives that are going to actually run through the end of the war. And I want to kind of go over a couple of those. So, now Foch, with, he determines that, let's see, well, let me go back to that one. Now with the attack at, at a Second Marin, they're attacking this salient right here. And what Foch looks at is he looks at the line and he says there are several of these salients that are impinging upon Allied transportation. So he develops a plan for the Allies to make offensives against these salients. They're already doing one here, and then they're going to follow that on with a British attack against this salient uh, coming out of the town of Amiens. That's going to begin on 8 August. That will be followed on by a, a uh, Franco-British-Belgian attack up here around the town of Ypres. And then the Americans are going to uh, come into this with the plan to engage right here around the salient at some hell. In August, we also have the creation of the American First Army, uh, the First Field Army, and that is going to initially be under the command of General uh, John Pershing. Uh, General Liggett, I should mention, at this time is the commander of First Corps, and he is going to be down when in the offensive against uh, in the Anne Marne, he is commanding First Corps. Uh, and they are uh, as a part of a French army. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have in August several different, the Allies are starting to go on the attack. But Foch starts to see that the Allies are starting to make tremendous gains and they are achieving some really spectacular results. So what he does is he changes plans and what he decides is that this is uh, just a look at the German defensive positions. So these are the main German lines, uh, defensive networks, and these are, these are actually very, very deep. E each line is a series of lines, so it's not just one trench line. But what Foch starts to see is that, whereas initially he had thought of the individual little salients, he starts to say, you know, this whole thing is actually one big salient and the Germans are getting weaker, and I'm getting stronger, or the Allies are getting stronger, particularly with the, Ameri the arrival of the Americans. So when he make, Foch makes the determination that what, we're going, what he wants to do is launch a series of offensives against the, Ger the German line, all along the line. We're going to have an attack up here by the uh, Army Group Flanders, which is a Franco-Belgian uh, offensive uh, with some British but uh, also with some Americans. We're going to have the British Army is going to continue attacking in here. Uh, I should mention that in the British attack of at Amiens and along this uh, in the region of the Somme the 80th Division was there. Uh, they were taking part. That was their first uh, taste of combat. The French are going to be launching an several offensives here in what's known as the Wa, uh, the Wa region. And where, so where do the Americans fit in? Well, the Americans fit in right here. And this is the region that's known as the Meuse Argonne. Uh, this is the, the, the Argonne Forest. This is the River Meuse. And it's the region, and it's the, the, the span of, of terrain in between those two. And what Foch wants to do is he wants to target this right here, 
which is called Meziers. And there's a rail line right there. And if the Allies can cut that rail line, then they will effectively cut all German supply for this entire area. Otherwise, the Germans have to come all the way up through here, which is very difficult. So he's going to do that with the combined Franco-American attack. We have the, Fran the French are going to, French Fourth Army is going to be attacking here, and the American First Army is going to be attacking here. This is just an idea of, um, it's kind of a slide I just wanted to give to show that we are American forces. Every single blue box there is where Americans are going to be fighting on the Western Front in the British sector. That's everywhere we're going to be fighting in the French sector. And this is in addition to the attacks at saint Mihiel and Meuse-Argonne. So it's during these campaigns, I don't want you to think that we're just engaged in the Meuse-Argonne. We're actually engaged all along the Western Front. So, okay. So we're going to make an offensive in, at the Meuse-Argonne. And he is going to bring, and we're going to concentrate about 600,000 American soldiers in this area over the course of about 10 to 12 days in September of 1916, or excuse me, 1918. The, right down here we have 1st Corps, so there's Liggett, uh, American 5th Corps under Cameron, American 3rd Corps under Bullard. Um, to be able to put this into perspective, an American division at this time has roughly 25,000, uh, 28,000 men if you include their trains. So 25,000 soldiers are in a division. Uh, an American company, a rifle company, is about 250. So just, these are very, very big units. So along the, along the attack line, the Americans are going to have nine divisions. They're going to be prepared for this assault. And again, the idea is to make it all the way up to Miz Sedan and Maziers, which are up way up there. They're actually off the map. So the plan is to, so as the Allies are going on the attack all along the Western Front, here's where the Americans are going to get into it and take part in this Grand Allied Counteroffensive, or Grand Allied Offensive, rather. And this is going to be the first day. Now, the initial plan for Pershing as the Army commander is to drive essentially about 10 kilometers, 10 to uh, 10 kilometers in on the first day, uh, followed on by a, a, another drive of 10 kilometers the next day. Um, I don't know if you can see the scale, but they don't get 10 kilometers. In fact, they get, there's a high, high ground position right here at Montfaucon, so they're gonna batter against that. This is very difficult terrain, it's very hilly. There's high ground over here, there's high ground here. So it is, and the Germans have spent the last about four years, or three to four years, building defensive systems within this area. So it's going to be very, very challenging. And they don't really make any gains. You'll, you'll certainly notice down here in the area of the 77th Division that they, in fact, only are going to be able to advance roughly two kilometers. It's because they're fighting in the Argonne Forest, which is having, I've been there, it is very, very, it's like a series of ridgebacks, it's a lot of ravines, it's very dense foliage, it's very, very difficult uh, terrain to fight in. So, the attack is gonna happen on 26 September. And this is the first and second day. And in fact, they only make it up to about here by the 1st of October. One of the problems that's happening is, again, this area right in here, the Argonne Forest. And what we, there we go. So what we're gonna see is these are some of the follow-on attacks uh, in the beginning of October. And this is the area where I wanna focus on. It's right over here on the left, where in the first core sector. And this is where Liggett, is going to uh, pop up again. The Germans are going to be able to block the advance through the Argonne. And you'll see this little pocket here. That's actually where the Lost Battalion was. So the line is down here. And what Liggett decides is that he is going to have first, the First Corps make a oblique attack, a flank attack, into the German line to try and free up all of this area. 
So he, so while the while the American, the other two core are over here, Liggett essentially is going to have turn his core and and put in units like the the American 28th Division, the uh, uh, or the the 28th and the 82nd Division. Uh, First Division is also going to go in, and they're going to attack into the German flank. And this is. It's during this action that we get the famous uh, uh, instance where Sergeant York, uh, Alvin York, is going to uh, capture and uh, kill a number of Germans and capture r over roughly 130 Germans uh, in the attack. <coughs> and it's successful. Uh, it, the lost battalion is going to be relieved. The Germans are gonna start pulling back. And then we have the beginnings of what is known as phase two. And so by the middle, by, by roughly the 10th of October, the Americans have made it to what is the strongest defensive position, or the, the strongest German defensive position in the war, or excuse me, in the area. It's this line, it's known as the Hindenburg Line, or it's part of the Hindenburg Line, and it is a series of trenches and interlocking machine gun positions, pre-sighted artillery, so a lot of barbed wire, so on and so forth. So this begins phase two. It's going to be cracking that line. And it's at this point that Pershing realizes that he is overloaded. He's doing too much. He's the commander of not only uh, the first army, but he's also the commander of the first or of, of the overall AEF. So he steps back and he is going to elevate his best corps commander, Hunter Liggett, to take over command of First Army. Uh, he elevates uh, General Bullard to take over what will be the newly created Second Army. So this is where Liggett really takes on uh, the command of First Army, and he will be the commander through the next month, uh, basically the end of the war. Now there's a series of attacks that are going on during this period from about 12 to 16 September or October, and they are going to be able to crack the line. Liggett is in charge, but he's not necessarily directing them. But what he finds is that, excuse me, is that the American Army, or the First Army, is tired. And so what Liggett does is he institutes an operational pause. He, there are some small little attacks to clean up the line, but what he does is he brings in his best forces, he uh, pulls units out of the line that need additional training and need rest and refit, and they start developing a plan for a singular attack against the Germans to try and truly break through the line. And this is gonna be the last week or so of October of 1918. So when we get to the end of October, the beginning of November, the Americans are ready. And on 1 November, they're going to launch an attack. And that's what it looks like. It is going to be a phenomenal success. It is going to, the American 5th Corps is going to burst through the center of the German line, uh, with, led by American 2nd Division. But you'll see the 80th is right here. Um, the, oh, I forgot to mention that the, excuse me, the 91st, yeah, let me throw you in here. 80th Division's right there, and the 91st Division is right here. So they are all going to be engaged, or both going to be engaged in these operations. Uh, the 80th Division is actually going to fight in all three phases of the Meuse-Argonne. Uh, the 91st Division uh, would have, except they are going to be sent um, about they're going to, after their initial attack, they, along with the 37th Division, are going to be sent to assist uh, Allied of operations in Flanders, so up in Belgium. And that's why they're going to be up there, is because the British had requested additional forces, and Pershing is going to send those two units. So this is going to be a spectacular success. It has shattered the German line. The Germans have no more defensive positions within this sector, so they have to start falling back to the Meuse River. And that's when we get this. This is the last roughly 10 days of the war. So, and then the German line is collapsing all along the Western Front, and they are going to sue for peace. 
So to just put this into perspective, unfortunately I don't have the other map with me, but the initial line is right here. So that's where the Americans start. It takes them five weeks to get up to here. So that's roughly, it's roughly 10 miles. They go to here in 11 days. So five weeks down there, 11 days to do that. So this is really, and this is a testament, one, to obviously the bravery and determination of the American soldier, but it also shows that Liggett understands by this time that if you can uh, engage in a small set piece battle and break through the, the line, then he can achieve a tremendous follow on effect where it forces the Germans back. And so this is kind of, this is the Meuse Argonne. This is, this, this is the largest battle in American history. 1.2 million uh, soldiers are going to fight in the battle. It lasts roughly 47 days. Uh, roughly 25, 26,000 uh, KIA, uh, another roughly 100,000 uh, casualties in total uh, within the American army. So this is, how, this is the American portion. Uh, the Allies are also going to be achieving great, uh, tremendous success all along the line. So beginning with the Second Battle of the Marne through the offensives of October and November, we really see that the Allies, in fact, are going to win the war and f on the ground they're going to force the Germans to agree to an armistice. And the, it has often been said that the United States was not a, did not make a material impact in terms of the fighting. Um, in terms of winning the war on the ground, that our contribution was more materiel, more morale, and more freeing up uh, allied units from service in quiet sectors to for service in combat sectors. And I think that what you can see is through an examination of, of Liggett and of what the, force, what the American forces actually do, we are going to be contributing significantly to the combat operations on the Western Front. And we are going to uh, be right there in the middle of the effort by the Allies, and it is a collective effort. Uh, it is, it is uh, no one nation could have done it on their own. No one nation deserves credit for victory. It was truly an allied effort, but we, the United States, the AEF, First Army, Hunter Liggett, the 80th, the 91st Division, we are an integral part of that victory and of achieving victory in the First World War which was roughly almost exactly 100 years to go today, three days from now. So thank you very much, and I'd like to open it up now to any questions. Yes? I've always heard that the, um, the armistice itself, uh, because it was so pecuniary on the, on the, the Germans helped lead to the Second World War. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, the idea that the armistice, and it's actually more the peace treaty, the, the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the armistice is just a ceasefire. Uh, the, the peace treaty that is going to follow on, which is the Treaty of Versailles, um, there are several different clauses in that. One specifically known as the War Guilt Clause, where Germany had to take responsibility for starting the war, and then the Germans had to pay uh, were saddled with a number of reparations, uh, money that they had to reimburse the Allies for the cost of the war. There's an argument that this was uh, especially harsh and onerous and led to the Second World War, uh, the, uh, the rise of Nazi Germany and the Second World War. I don't generally support that argument because it there's about 20 years between the end of the First World War and the outbreak of the Second World War. Uh, there are a number of different things that happen in the 1920s uh, that, you know, there are a lot of actions that the Germans take, there's a lot of actions that the, that the, the Europeans take. There are, you know, I don't like to get into direct causation. Um, the, many people, in fact, 
are going to use the, the war as an excuse for why Nazi Germany uh, came about. Uh, I tend to think that it had a lot more to do with internal German politics and the, um, the Great Depression uh, after the collapse of the American economy. Uh, and all of those things are happening in the 1920s and they're, they're not necessarily uh, because of the war, they're more how the nations decided to act. And that's what led into the Second World War. Yes, sir. Sir, would you comment on the role of the U.S. Army in Russia immediately after the First World War? Sure. Uh, the question was, what was, what is the, can I comment on the role of the U.S. Army in Russia after the First World War, or at the end of the First World War and immediately after? Um, yeah, most people don't know that we were actually in Russia. We send two expeditionary forces there. Uh, one is going to go to North Russia out of uh, Murmansk, and one is going to go to Siberia, uh, based out of Vladivostok. One of the forces is going to be roughly 5,000 men. Uh, the other one's going to be roughly 8,000. Um, I could probably sum it up in a fairly dirty word, but I'm not going to. It is a, uh, um, it is a f folly of errors. Uh, um, the, nobody really knows what the Allies are doing in Russia. The Allies don't really know what they're doing in Russia. Uh, theoretically, we're supposed to maintain contr positive control over war material. There's a civil war going on in Russia, mainly between uh, the communist forces, who are known as the Bolsheviks, or the red, uh, the red Russians, and then the white forces. But there's factionalism within the communists and within the white. There's also a group of Czech and Slovakians who were part of what's known as the Czech Legion, which is roughly, there's about 50,000 of them that are kind of fighting their way back and forth across Russia. Uh, which you ever get into the story of the Czech Legion, it's fantastic. You know, they're, they're, they have this like crazy idea that they're gonna fight across Siberia and get on a boat, go to America, take a train across America and get on another boat and go fight on the Western Front. It's, I, I love these guys, they're, they're fantastic. But um, it's really confused and it, really kind of ends with nothing happening other in terms of us making a positive impact we're just kind of there and we do engage against the the the, the communist forces particularly in north russia um but really n we're not taking an active trying to take an active role in the combat and besides the allied forces are pretty tired and eventually what happens is that the Bolsheviks take over everything and we just pull out. So it's, it's this really weird kind of footnote that nobody, no Americans really know why we were there. Uh, the Russians know. They, they remember though that, that we actually did invade and, and we were not asked to come in. No. Is, that, is that good? Yes, thank you, sir. Sure. Um, actually, since we have some time, if I can, I'll swing back to you. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One's real quick. You mentioned the National Army. That's the former name of the Army Reserve. Uh, no, sir. Actually, the what happens is is they create the National Army, and yes, the, the units are that were the National Army units will eventually become the Army Reserve. So it's a little different, but yeah, that's that's how it's going to happen. Um, it's important to understand that, or to, to remember that by the time we really get into combat, there is no effective distinction between a regular unit, a guard unit, and a national army unit because they had brought in uh, replacements and they had just funneled them into the entire army in what was known as the United States Army. And this is really where they try to create this, uh, this concept of one, one force and it, it really dates to then. The second question is, there were a lot of new technologies at the beginning of the war that no one really anticipated the effects of on fighting. Do you see parallels between that situation and the technologies of today and our, our next fight? The question is, uh, the, that, uh, do I see any parallels between uh, the technologies that were, or the how new the technology was at the time, uh, and the impact on the fight to today with new technology. I think that 
Like with anything in terms of if you look at a at, at military development on a large enough scale that there are continual ebb and flow. Um, right, the, you know, the, the, the sword and the shield, which is stronger. And there are certainly uh, technologies at the time that had a tremendous impact, um, particularly, uh, most notably, like poison gas, uh, the ev eventual development of the tank, um, which is, uh, you know, the internal combustion engine and so on and so forth, uh, the airplane. The, but I think that what the greatest folly that the uh, great armies did was that they, during the First World War, was that they anticipated um, rapid victory. And I think that the greatest danger, uh, kind of not specifying any certain technology, the greatest danger is in any kind of military operation is underestimating uh, the cost necessary and the resources necessary to achieve your strategic out the the preferred strategic outcome, and so I think that I don't know necessarily if we are uh, if there are any direct parallels. Uh, I know we have the uh, things like cyber and um, so on and so forth that are really kind of the new the new battle battlegrounds of uh, of the 21st century. Um, I think that that's a part of warfare, is that you always are going to have to be able to see the, uh, prepare for the unanticipated, and but that you should never assume a best case scenario, and you should always operate off of a potential worst case scenario. Is that, is that all we have time? Okay, well again, thank you all very much. Uh, I appreciate it, and I'm um, going to be here if you have any questions.